Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris and Jesse. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly podcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris. With me, as always, is Jesse. Hello. And with this episode, we have a very special guest we're happy to have on our show, Garrett Weinzerl, who, uh, in addition to being a guitar player, which of course is the focus of today's show, uh, is a graphic designer. Um, his website is nomoonart.com, and he is responsible for our overlay and all of our graphics, and we're very grateful for those are very well done. Uh, thank you, Garrett. And in addition, uh, he's also a fellow podcaster uh, with a podcast network called amove.tv, where he hosts several shows, including The Angry Chicken and Into the Nexus. And those are podcasts that are related to gaming and geek culture. So welcome, Garrett. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. It's nice to, it's nice to finally meet you both. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a while. We're pretty excited to have you on the show. So... Uh, what we do is we are going to sort of bypass all of our, our typical um, segments and go straight into chatting guitars with Garrett. That's going to be that might Sweet. be today's title actually. <laughs> <laughs> guitars with Garrett. Yeah. So um, Garrett, uh, how long have you been playing? Oh geez, I've been playing since I think I was twelve, and I'm twenty nine now. So do the math. Okay, cool. <laughs> a while. <laughs> so you're somewhere in between me and Jesse in terms of experience. Yes, yeah. Although I'm, I'm uh, actual like experience and proper training probably differs pretty heavily because I, I haven't had a classical lesson since probably the second year I was playing guitar, mm -hmm. like, a, like a proper guitar lesson. Uh, after that, it was just self teaching and really just a, just a hobby, a way to get me out of the chair. Yeah, Garrett, you say like you say it like that's not the normal way the guitar players play. Right. <laughs> I was gonna say it sounds pretty common. I'm the weird one with like lessons for almost five years now. Right. <laughs> so. Well, it, it's 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 because it's something I really I really enjoy, and I wish I had kept up with the with like the proper lessons and regiments because I I honestly like I can't read music. Um, I, I'm not particularly. I, I don't know all of the chords by by. By heart, like if you told me played, you know, G. Okay, I, I can play a G chord, but if you got more specific, probably couldn't. Right, wouldn't know what you're talking about. So a lot of it for me is, um, I mean, for me, my my first instrument was was piano, mm -hmm. and uh, I was being taught using the Suzuki method. So you were pretty much learning by listening and almost just memorization. Uh, at least that's how I how I did it. How I remembered songs. Um, so once I was done taking proper guitar lessons, I, I kind of just did the same thing. I, you know, I was in, in and out of a lot of garage bands and just playing a lot of cover songs. And I would just I would just learn songs just by listening to them and kind of just noodling around or just using tabs. Right. I would say that's pretty typical. Actually, I would agree with you. Because <laughs> you know, when, uh, my wife and I started playing guitar together at the same time, and she has a background piano, viola, you know, these classical instruments. I had almost zero background in music, and she got real frustrated. She's like, "I want to learn how to read the sheet music." And her guitar instructor and mine at the time was like, "Well, guitarists don't read sheet music." <laughs> well, so I, I distinctly remember trying out for uh, for like jazz band in high school. And they sit you down and they, they put a sheet of music in front of you. I'm just like, what what is this for? <laughs> right. <laughs> what are those dots with stems? What do those things mean? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm actually trying to learn piano now. I'm self, self-teaching through a book. And I'm going through the opposite thing. It's like notes. Like, what? Well, just give me the key number, you know? What, what are these like? bird droppings on this page? <laughs> oh. could, you, could you imagine, though, for a second, like, like remove yourself from 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 common like common sense like what a piano tab would look like there's so many keys it would it would be mind-boggling well you know i have a funny story about that um my uh stepmother my my father's wife uh when she was young she actually developed a tab system for piano wow huh. they had this keyboard in her house she didn't have lessons they didn't have money for lessons whatever so she decided to learn how to play songs by listening to notes and writing down numbers on the keys wow and then she would just you know go that has to be crazy. Yeah, that that's that's. I mean, it can be done clearly. Um, but that, yeah, that's that's. I don't even want to. I don't want to look at a piece of paper that had just that much information on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would be a lot of information density. 
Yeah, it's like 88 oh. keys or something on a full-size piano. So, yeah. yeah, that would just be awful. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, um, who are some of your favorite guitarists, bands? What kind of music do you like to play? Uh, for me, it, it, it always comes back to pop punk for the most part. So uh, I'm, I, I don't consider myself a good guitarist because I don't consider most pop punk guitarists good guitarists. Uh, that's right. what I what I enjoyed playing. I mean, c coming up through high school and college, all of the bands that I were in, that was the type of music that we were playing. Uh -huh. And uh, a lot of times we would find ourselves um, without a singer and without a second guitarist. So I was usually just stuck playing rhythm and singing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I didn't for for a very long time didn't have any interest in really moving beyond that. Um, lately, I've 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 kind of gotten gotten back into guitar there was a, a good stint there immediately after college where I, I moved away and just had too many things on my plate mm -hmm. and I didn't play for a while uh, probably for maybe three years didn't really touch the guitar at all mm -hmm. um, then my life kind of settled down and recently uh, within the last probably year year and a half I made it a point like at five as soon as I'm done with the work day like I'm gonna stand up attach the strap to the guitar and and get on my feet for at least half an hour and just just play some songs yeah. right um, so as, as, as far as like guitarists that I, I grew up really, really liking, um, I mean, my favorite band uh, still is, uh, is Green Day. It was the, the first band that I, I really gravitated towards that, that like, I would call myself like a, a fan of. There were, there were bands that came before, uh, like the first CD I ever bought with my own money was Goldfinger's Hang Ups. It was a ska album. Uh huh. Um, but but Green Day was the first one where it's like I wanted to learn more about the band and I wanted to know what guitar he was playing, what amp he was using, what distortion pedal, what the gear was. It, it that, that was the first band that made me kind of a gearhead, right? Um, because um, I just I just loved the the sound, that kind of lo-fi. It, it was it was crunchy, but it wasn't like it, not, it wasn't metal crunchy. It was, it was fuzzy. gnarly. <laughs> yeah, just, I, I was I liked how bad the guitar sounded. As weird as that that might that might sound, but I just liked the. It was almost like a texture thing with me, which mm -hmm. is how it sounded. And so that kind of led me down the path of you know, uh, picking up certain instruments and whatnot. Uh, it just so happened my first guitar was a, a Fender Stratocaster. Now, I know the famous Green Day guitar is actually, I believe, a Fernandez before they got sued by Fender and they had to stop making a guitar that looked exactly like a Stratocaster. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but yeah, it just so happened to uh, my first electric guitar was a was a Fender Stratocaster that I bought from a pawn shop. So once I actually started diving in and finding out, oh, he, he plays a, a Strat. Cool. I'm already halfway there. <laughs> well, uh, you lucked out that you had something that was a fairly close copy of that copy of what you had. <laughs> now, I, he, he took out the, the last single coil and put in a humbucker, which I still have never gotten around to doing. It's something I've been wanting. I still have that guitar. And at some point I would like to put a... Uh, I would like to drop a humbucker in the in the the last the third in the third single slot area, but uh, just haven't gotten around to doing it. But eventually, I I uh, I got myself a uh, a Gibson Les Paul, um, so that's like my nice guitar. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was my first and still only electric that has humbuckers in it. So I only have the Strat, the Les Paul, and a Washburn acoustic, which was actually my very first guitar that was purchased for my mom, and she never learned how to play it. <laughs> So. Now that too is a typical story. <laughs> That's a typical story, yes. And I, I suspect some of my used guitars were never played. So uh, before by the previous owner, so I totally get that. Yeah, no, it sounds like you have all of your bases actually covered. You've got the single coils, you've got the humbuckers. That's all you really need when it comes down to uh, sort of the basics. What do you want to play? If you want to play the broad spectrum of things, you've got it covered. Absolutely. That said, I've been I've been trying to find an excuse to buy a semi hollow because I've always wanted one. I love the way they sound. Yeah, the excuse is you want it. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh uh, yeah. I I you know uh, I just got married and we're looking for a home, so it's hard to sell that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I um I've been wanting to get like a thin line Telecaster for a long time. They're just such cool guitars. They are cool guitars. Yeah. Yes, they are. So, but but yeah, I mean that was like I said that was the first thing, and 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 i still really enjoy that that genre of music um other guitarists i really like like i really like the guitarist from uh newfound glory they're another pop punk band if you're not familiar with them or originally from florida where i live so they're kind of hometown heroes uh-huh uh, okay they used to have two guitarists the they kicked the rhythm out and they just stayed as a four piece with one guitarist 
and the lead guitarist's name is Chad. Uh, and I just really like his style because he, he he's clearly influenced from uh, from hardcore mm-hmm. because he there's a lot of you'll you'll notice it in their songs where he the guitar syncs up with the drums uh, yeah. almost like bass uh, and it's just got this great chug and rhythm to it and I really like that too and it's something that I've always kind of glommed onto with with his particular style so when it comes into something that has a little bit more of a lead type sound. Uh, Probably Chad's style from Newfound Glory is my favorite. Yeah, cool. that's cool. I'm not that familiar with the band myself. I'm not that familiar with the the pop punk sort of thing. I mean, the Green Day hits, of course. Yeah, you know, out there, and, and I have a particular penchant for Bowling for Soup for some reason. <laughs> I, hit me with a blast from the past. I haven't heard them in forever. <laughs> I love those guys. I realize um, they're younger than Green Day, but I <laughs> I listen to Green Day more regularly. So yeah. But it's like they have this sort of um, – maybe it's a little more childish version, but that sort of snarky, irreverent thing. Oh, going. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I get exactly what you're going for. And I've always – I mean that type of music in general, like if, if you pull open my iPod, that's – Yeah. If, I guess – sorry, the iPod app on my iPhone. Right. <laughs> that's not right. anymore. Um, that's, you know, that's the kind of stuff you're going to find. So I've always – always really been attracted to that type of music i can't even tell you why i'm I, I, probably because i got into it when i was an angsty teen and i just never grew up in my taste <laughs> well i still listen to judas priest once in a while so <laughs> can't beat that yeah i mean growing up my dad was always listening to acdc and van halen so i, I do have i do have an appreciation for for more classic guitarists as well uh had a big poster of randy rhodes on my wall growing up <sighs> I love Randy Rhodes. <laughs> oh yeah, everyone. Who, you picked up a guitar. That's it's like well, Randy Rhodes and and, and Hendrix, right? You, it's required. Oh like, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you have to work through at least part of the Hendrix catalog at some point if you've ever played guitar, at least electric guitar. Uh, if you're playing nothing but classical guitar, maybe not so much. But uh, I'm not sure how all along the Watchtower would work out on a classical guitar. It might be pretty cool. I don't know. Um, so you mentioned uh, Garrick that you basically wanted to emulate um, Green Day and you were really interested in amps and pedals. Um, can you talk a little bit about what amps you play through or pedals? Well, I was also constrained by a budget. So sure. um, I never got the amp. I, I want obviously a, like a Marshall tube amp because that's, that's exactly what, it, what Green Day use. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's never, again, have never gotten to the point in my life where I could uh, make that decision. It would be financially sound. Um, so for the longest time, I just had whatever I could find at a pawn shop. I, I still have a Randall POS that was, I bought it because it was loud enough to be heard over drums. It sounds like, <laughs> right. it sounds like garbage. Still have it, still works. It has two 12-inch Celestian speakers in it, so nice speakers. Nice. But the, solid, the, the amp itself is pretty trash. Um, and uh, when I started taking the garage band thing a little more seriously in the late high school years and into early college, I did buy myself a crate or sorry, an Ibanez half stack, mm-hmm. um, which sounded really nice. It was still not tube because the second you add a tube in there, it's it significantly increases the price, but it was way better sounding uh, than anything I've had in the past. So, um, that, that was like my, the, the, the nicest amp I've ever owned. Unfortunately, it was also stolen by a drummer. Oh no! So, I no longer have it. Yeah, we had a. It was my. It was my first band with a proper practice space. We we rented it like at a not a rent a center, uh, not like but a a storage facility that had power. Right. Okay. A rental space, and uh, I was the last one to come and clean my stuff out, and it was just missing. Oh. <laughs> so so I don't, disappointing. I don't have that anymore. So now I'm just. I have a little crate practice amp that's loud enough uh, for the twelve by twelve office. And that's that's what I play through. But as far as pedals, um, really, I just use the clean setting on the amp. I have a blues driver, which is the the same pedal that uh, Billy Joe from Green Day uses, and mm-hmm. I have a cheap Digitech uh, grunge pedal, which is not advertised correctly. It might as well be a metal pedal. It is a fuzzy, fuzzy <sighs> distortion. Um, but uh, it, it, when I really need a lot of a lot of crunch, that's what I use. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I love my blues driver. I don't get it out nearly as much to play. Uh, you know, no reason to apologize here for um, solid state amps because neither Jesse or I are two purists at all. No, no, no. So, yeah. Between In the fact, two of us, see, he's got the only two, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as of mostly, a few weeks ago. <laughs> right. We've been doing mostly modeling. Uh, I've been doing mostly modeling sort of on Jesse's lead. Um, Jesse's been into modeling for a long time. And, uh, you know, 
you can get a nice inexpensive modeling amp, um, which will sound close enough to that Marshall that uh, in your 12 by 12 office, you probably won't notice the difference. Right, exactly. It's, it, 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 it's, it's all about what you're doing with it, right? Like, yeah, if you're playing an arena and you're running it through a, a PA system and you have it mic'd up, you might want something a little higher fidelity. But if you're just practicing at home, yeah. I don't think anything crazy. That said, um, one of my, my childhood friends, who's actually probably the best pl- bass player I've ever met in my life, and I could never keep him in my bands. Uh, <laughs> he's the only kid in town who actually knew how to play bass. He wasn't just a guitarist uh, right. <laughs> that wasn't good enough to be a guitarist. <laughs> um, uh, he's, uh, I always hung out over at his family's place, and his, his dad, um, just a, a music nut job, total old school blues fan. And, and he has an old uh, Fender twin tube amp. Probably, I think it's like 100 watts. So it's a combo, but it's a tube amp. And that thing just sounds amazing. And actually, he was back here for Christmas just uh, two months ago now. Went over, saw the family. His dad had picked up two new Fender tube amps. And just looking at this <laughs> wow. I, I want this. I want this so much. They, they, sound, they just sound so good. Yeah. They do. Yeah, they do. They're insanely we- heavy. <laughs> yes. Twin, yes, oh my gosh <laughs> but so is that old piece of junk randall solid state that i have so. that's a good point <laughs> <laughs> yeah the um back about a year ago jesse and i went amp shopping and we were playing through some twins and you're right they sound fantastic um but shoot i think the one we played was 1400 bucks yeah yeah that was it's yeah. pricey for someone who just plays in his bedroom you know that or office that's not <sighs> it's, it's so yeah, it's so it's incredibly unnecessary. Also, where, where are you going to put that thing? Like, yeah, it's true. Let alone yeah. the, the stack that you were thinking of. <laughs> right. Yeah. What do you yeah, do I with remember, that? I remember having my my half stack in my bedroom growing up and just looking back on it like, man, that was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But, you know, when you're 18 years old, that's like the coolest thing ever. So, Oh, that's true. Definitely. And, you know, I kind of feel bad. I, I never actually had I had a little twin sort of thing, a PV heritage. But I never had like the half stack, and I always was envious of you people who did. <laughs> you were so much cooler than me. It was nice, and oh, the the the, the feedback you could get by walking up to it <laughs> without even trying. Oh yeah, absolutely. Just uh, volume at the right level. You barely have to uh, you barely have to try. Yeah, yeah. No, I the volume is the issue because you know I have a hundred watt Fender Mustang. And I got that only because it has the LCD screen built in because it's one of those modeling amps. I can't get the master past three. Well, I can. If my wife's in the house, I can't do it past two. Um, <laughs> if the dog's in the house. If the dog's in the house, <laughs> past three, and she gives me this real worried look. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? I, uh, that's my favorite thing to do when the neighbors uh, are clearly ignoring their dog barking in my bedroom window. Is like, okay, cool. I guess I'm going to practice guitar at the loudest volume I can handle. Nice. With the amp in the window. <laughs> Joy, neighbors, enjoy. <laughs> and the other thing is you can't actually, with those huge amps, you really can't get the sound you want as far, you know, that cranked up sort of sound because there's just no way. I mean, a lot of the classic uh, recorded sounds are like actually smaller amps. You know, you grab a pig nose or something. Well, I'm still amazed nowadays uh, by the amount of bands. I can't think of a specific one in off the top of my head, but I'll go and see a uh, go and see a, a concert and half the bands nowadays they just have a, a combo like orange yeah. and it's just it's just mic'd up for the PA yep uh, you don't necessarily need a, a half stack anymore gone are gone are the days of 80s hair metal and speaker walls sadly. that's true that's yeah. true I, I always wonder how many of those were actually actually playing <laughs> I mean functional functional speakers as opposed to just for show right exactly <laughs> I think that can be measured by hearing loss there should be a medical study how many 80s hair band um players still can hear yeah well certainly if i was a roadie i don't want to carry a loaded speaker cabinet i'd rather have just the you know cardboard ones i think i finally i think i I finally tipped over the the age where loud noises affect me because uh i went i went to go see newfound glory uh late last year and uh, turnstile a a popular hardcore band opened for them Mm -hmm. and i still have trouble hearing out of my right ear as a result of that particular concert yeah, pretty early on, I got into the uh, earplugs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember being a kid and, and like going to my first few shows and being like, why would you wear earplugs when going to a show? And now I'm 29, and I absolutely understand it. Those people were so much smarter than me. 
<laughs> yeah, I can imagine, you know, being on stage, actually. It's, uh, I was on, um, I played on stage only one time, and it was actually my harmonica. And uh, it was with a friend's band, and I couldn't hear myself. And so I something because I didn't have earplugs or anything in. So I was like, wow, I wish, you know, I don't know what I just played, but uh, no one's complaining, so it must be good enough. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> okay. No one looked at me like, you know, cut it out, so we should be okay. Oh yeah, I remember my first my first few like playing live shows, whether it was backyards or at the local VFW, like and and it never dawned on me going to concerts before then, like oh that's what monitors are for. Oh yeah. right, yeah, because I couldn't hear anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a brave new world now. I mean, there's a lot of these uh, in ear monitors, you know, so the stage volume is well can be a lot less, of course. You know, it's, oh. it isn't always. Yeah, absolutely. The amount of bands I go and see now that have in your monitors compared to just like five years ago. Uh, it seems to have, you know, really caught on, I'm assuming because it's gotten cheaper. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, Garrett, that you sort of have carved out a somewhat regular practice time for yourself after work. Yeah, more or less on days. Yeah. When I don't have a five o'clock podcast recording. Um, I'll usually turn the amp on, stand up, play guitar for about half an hour. Um, at this point I've just kind of, um, I put together just a playlist of songs either I'm in the middle of learning or I already know how to play and just okay. kind of throw it on shuffle because <laughs> I like I still like playing along to a beat in a band yeah um, I've, I've never really just enjoyed just kind of sitting down and playing guitar alone with nothing else going on sure sure yeah do you have so basically just like immediately right into songs is there a warm-up or anything like that that you do uh, uh, depends on how I feel that day uh, sure it's, it's Florida so I I'm, I usually have the uh, the benefit of it almost always being warm. Um, but if it is cold in here, I'll usually start with something slower because my fingers aren't moving as fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, but most of the time, yeah, it's it, like, like nothing I play. It's I'm, I've never gotten into shredding or metal or anything like that. So a lot of the stuff I play is not uh, particularly fast finger work. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, if I, if it's something I know how to play, I can just throw it on and be good to go. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. The backing tracks today, it's, it's just, it's so cool that you can get so much. Yeah. Oh, what, what, do you, what do you mean? Like you can get um, sort of backing tracks out there that have uh, the guitar part missing or, you know, so you can play along and be the guitar. You're, you're teaching me something. I didn't know this was a thing. Oh, this is going to oh. open a whole new world for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Guitar playing. So, yeah, you, you go to YouTube and just search guitar backing track. And uh, what you'll find are hundreds, thousands of recordings that will say, you know, blue shuffle in E or, you know, Satriani style guitar backing track in A, right? No way. Yeah. <laughs> so like, and they'll vary. I mean, sometimes you'll have a full, in fact, sometimes you'll have a, a rhythm guitar part in there as well. Sometimes it's just really skeleton, you know, drums and bass or whatever. Of course, with jazz, sometimes there's a piano or whatever. You know, and they vary. And if you're looking for a specific song, it might be hard to find. Um, although there's a lot of that out there as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I was coming up, it was like they had these series of things called the music minus one. So you, if you were a drummer, they'd have the thing re-recorded but with no drums in it. Or maybe drums in one channel and the rest in the other. Um, and the same for guitar or bass. But you actually had to buy like records if anybody remembers what those are <laughs> you know I do, but that's just because i'm trying to i i guess uh, the term is be a hipster right <laughs> yeah see but the thing is is that real music fidelity comes from wax cylinders that's right if you're not listening to wax cylinders you're just not getting all the lows <laughs> no <laughs> so but yeah those backing tracks you should uh check them out they uh you can get, like I said, a variety of stuff. There are some pitfalls involved. Sometimes, you know, there'll be like a rock backing track in F when it's actually in G. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Becomes pretty clear pretty quickly. Some of them are really nice. Some of them um, will have the actual chord that is being played at that moment pop up on the screen. And that's really cool if you're doing some blues stuff where they have some tricky turnarounds. You can sort of see what the chord progression is. So you can that visually section. follow along. Yeah. That. Exactly. Kind of like looking over at your bandmate to see where his hand's going. <laughs> yep. Some of them are, um, some of them just put the actual chord progression on the screen. It's not dynamic. Others have, you know, pictures of 
guitars or artists or whatever. But yeah, it's a, a whole big world out there of um, guitar backing tracks that Jesse uh, had opened me up to. And it's definitely made my playing a lot better. Oh, nice. I will definitely have to, uh, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, in addition, if you want something that's a bit more, I don't know, legit, quote unquote, there are books of backing tracks. We were just talking about this on our last show. Um, there's something called the Big Book of Backing Tracks that's written by Chad Johnson. And there's, I don't know, several hundred backing tracks. It comes with a flash drive that actually has the recordings, but the book has the chord progressions. And uh, that's been a pretty cool uh, tool. Jesse and I, the last time we jammed together, we, we broke that out and had a good time with some of the jazz stuff in there. I'm looking at it right now. That's pretty pretty cheap, too, on Amazon. Yeah. For, you know, I, I can't remember exactly how many. It's more than 150, though. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. I mean, some of them are really basic two-chord things that, you know, the sheet music is like two bars long. You know? Yeah. <laughs> or just a one-chord country shuffle or something like that. But, yeah. you know, a lot of them, though, are pretty interesting, especially um, some of the jazz ones, just because you get to see what the chord progressions are. And uh, I've been dabbling in jazz a little bit as of late. And it's been kind of helpful for me to see those. That's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm adding it to my wish list. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, as we, I'm totally not browsing the internet, guys. Sure. Well, no, they, um, what, they, what they also have on there is for each track, they have recommended scales. So what scale goes well with this? And it might be like a simple a pentatonic or it could be like, you know, over the one and four chords, play G mixolydian. But over the two and five chords, play, I don't know, F Dorian. That probably makes no sense at all. But I'm just making that up. Um but it's kind of nice, you know, and it's so it what happens I find on YouTube is that I get to a track and it's pretty much minor pentatonic all the way. And I just don't think of what else to play with the book. It says, oh, what? You should try G Mixolydian. I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. And give that a shot. I like that. It's like it's <laughs> it's it's tips and tricks if you have just a vague idea of how how guitar playing works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. great. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to pick this up for myself. Thanks for the suggestion, guys. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Learned something new today. Yeah. We aims to please. That's what we try to do around here on guitar uh, six strings things. So, um, <laughs> in addition, I, you had mentioned that uh, you were interested in a strat with a humbucking pickup. And yes. In the bridge, you probably can do that to your current strat. Oh yeah, I, I, if I said it, it's it's still not as clean. It still picks up a good amount of like electric distortion from the room, just from lights being on. Sure. Um, sure, but um, yeah, no, I know I could I could I know they make single coil humbuckers now that I could just swap in swap out. I just haven't gotten around to doing it. Yeah, I mean it depends on how deep you want to get because if you're willing to swap out that pick guard, <laughs> you could get a pick guard that has the humbucker in the bridge. Yeah, I do think I would need to route out some wood because I think that I don't know how they are now, but I think back then if it was. If it had like the diagonal last single coil that the wood is actually carved out in that shape. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Which is, it's whatever. It's, it's Mexican made. It's, it's not a, it's not an American strat. So it's not like I'm defacing something that's going to actually become more valuable as time goes on. So that's something I could do. Right. Um, that thing is, uh, that thing has been beat to hell and back. You, uh, you can, you can't see the, the paint on it anymore, which is a good thing because it was scratched all like crazy. It's just covered in stickers. Um, I had to redrill the the bottom strap hole with a wider a wider screw because it got so poor so horribly stripped. Uh huh. This is before I looked up uh, the trick with toothpicks and wood glue. Oh yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. I, I have since found that out, and uh, and actually the big screw is now starting to get stripped. So I think I might I might try that I might try that trick. Yep, that works. Uh, yeah. Or uh, sawdust and crazy glue can work too. That too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. I saw that as well. Um, but I, I've seen I've seen more tutorials on the toothpick thing, so I'm just going to assume that means that that's the better method. <laughs> probably, yeah. It probably so is. You've, you've relicked your uh, Mexican strat. This is worth more now. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, if I was a famous guitarist, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it tends to be the, tr uh, the, the trend, though, nowadays. You know, relic the guitar, and you can sell it for twice as much. Uh, yeah, no, I... I am a huge fan of the, the Mexican strats. I just got one myself a couple weeks ago, uh, put some new pickups in it, and it's a, it's a great playing guitar. Um, it sound, I love it. It sounds great. It actually stays in tune better than my, my American-made Gibson. Um, and, yeah, I just I love that guitar. It's also not as heavy. Like, I know, Part of me, I think, will never move away from the Strat being my favorite guitar, even though the Les Paul is... Way better, much better hardware. Sounds amazing. It's just something I love about a, a Fender Stratocaster. 
Well, the whole way better quality thing just doesn't go with the punk set <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Yeah. And I found that over time, I've gone through phases that I'll have sort of my single coil phase and I have my humbucker phase and I go back to my single coil phase. It just depends on what I'm playing at the time and what I'm listening to at the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I also, like, I think I'd like the bridge position for palm muting. Just it's for whatever, for, for my purposes, I'm more comfortable on a, on a strat versus a, versus a Les Paul. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. So I'm just the opposite. If I'm palm muting, I'll pull out my SG or my Les Paul because I find that raised bridge helps yeah. uh for me um and it's just you know a matter of personal preference yeah yeah, yeah that's true. definitely I think, I, I think it was just over time i probably ended up playing the strap more because it was less valuable so i would just leave it at the practice place and sure like, i don't care if this gets stolen who cares it's not that big of a loss um but uh yeah i just ended up playing it more so i think i'm just more accustomed to a, a strat overall i don't know it sounds like you really love this guitar if it got stolen i think it'd be a more at of this a hit. Point, Oh, yes. At this yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Back, back in the day when. Yeah. No, no. At this point, I've had it for so darn long. And it's like you know, I still remember the day like bringing like my money to the pawn shop and being like that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> so cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm too attached to it at this point, And it's worth nothing. So <laughs> there's no reason to get rid of it because um, there, there have definitely been points in my life where I'm like, maybe I should sell, sell uh, some guitars. And it's like, well. That one's not worth anything, so it's not at any risk of disappearing. Yeah, it's uh, selling guitars can be a thing of last resort, though, because everyone who I've talked to have sold guitars has at least one regret. Oh, my, yes. Yeah, at least one, if not multiple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I've, I've heard the same thing. I, I luckily haven't, haven't had to make that, uh, make, make that decision, but it's, it's, it's come close a few times, Yeah. specifically right after college. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure. You do have to eat, but you can't sell your babies. Ah, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. If, only you could, if only you could eat old guitar strings. Then it'd be <laughs> old guitar strings and picks that are worn out. That'd be good. Yes. I would feast. Ah, oh, plastic and metal <laughs> diet. Sounds good to me. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I think we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this episode up. It's been great having you, Garrett. We've had a great time. Uh, talking guitars with you today yeah thanks yeah, this was an absolute blast because all of my podcasts for the most part about video games I, I so seldomly get to geek out about music and um uh, it's something i i absolutely love so so thank cool. you guys for giving me this uh this chance to geek out about something else that i really like well we would love to have you on again uh, absolutely and what would you like to plug before we uh pop off of here oh uh, folks can find everything i do at amove.tv that's a m o v e TV uh, just launched relaunched a show called the angry nerd. It's me by myself. It's a very like kind of personal solo show. Um, so that's the newest thing folks can check out, uh, can check out. Cool. Sweet. We'll have links in the show notes. Absolutely. And uh, if, uh, listeners, if you've liked what you've heard, uh, please click like or subscribe. Uh, you can uh, listen to us on iTunes. You can watch us on YouTube. Uh, subscribe. You can email us at uh, sixstringsandthings at gmail.com. Yeah, I do know our email address. And uh, you can tweet us at SST Show. And until next time, everybody, just keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, is a Jester Cat production. For more on this show, please visit www.jestercat.com. You can follow us on Twitter at SST Show, and you can email the show at sixstringsandthings at gmail.com. Thanks to Jesse for playing the intro music. Mm-hmm.